The next phyla that we'll talk about is phylum arthropodum. So this is going to follow the same path as the previous phylum we talked about, phylum uh, nematoda. So again, starting with metazoa, the animals, and then going to eumetazoa, so the true animals, aka not uh, sponges. Then we're going to bilateral organisms, and because they're bilateral, that does mean they're triploblastic. We're going to our protostomes, so mouth formed first. We're going to our ectozoans, so those that molt, and then finally stopping with arthropoda. As a reminder, uh, so ectozoa is the super phylum, so this is a level above phylum, and then we're going to focus on phylum arthropoda. So phylum arthropoda are probably some of the most familiar organisms. Uh, they are the most diverse organisms, mainly because they house our insects, and insects have a lot of diversity. Because of their very fast life cycles, uh, evolution and natural selection act on them much quicker than, say, other organisms such as humans uh, or other mammals that have a much slower reproductive life cycle. So let's take a closer look at phylum arthropoda. So if you were to generalize all of the organisms in phylum arthropoda, these would be organisms that have body segments. We will talk about these more in a moment, but for example, you probably learned in earlier schooling that insects have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. That's what I mean by body segments. So if we look at their symmetry, um, this one a lot more obvious to tell versus, say, the nematodes, that this is bilateral symmetry. There is a clear left and right half. They are triploblastic organisms, and these guys are actually eucelomates. They do have a true body cavity. They've got the ectoderm on the outside, the endoderm on the inside, and then that mesoderm is lining both the endoderm and the ectoderm, leaving a coelom or body cavity in between. These guys do have complete digestion, so they do have a separate mouth and anus, and because they have complete digestion, we can use the term protostome or deuterostome, and these guys are protostomes, so their mouth is forming first. And as I mentioned earlier, um, this phylum of organisms is the most diverse phyla in our animal kingdom. The insects and other related organisms by far outnumber everything else uh, that we're going to learn about. And you know a lot of these organisms as well. So we are going to not talk about classes, but instead talk about subphylums. As a very quick reminder, remember we had a superphylum, such as ex uh, Ecdysozoa. We had a phylum, such as arthropoda, and then subphylum is underneath. Again, this is the most diverse group of organisms, meaning there's a lot of them. And going straight to the class level just didn't divide organisms up enough. So scientists added this subphylum level. And that's all we're going to talk about, at least within this phylum of organisms. So the first subphylum that we'll talk about is subphylum hexapoda. If you take a look um, at the name of the phylum, it kind of gives it away. So hex, referring to six, and pod, uh, referring to leg or foot. Typically, it's for foot. And so these are literally the six-footed organisms. These are your typical insects. It includes some other categories of organisms as well, but by and large, you can just say insects, and you're pretty much correct. And these guys have three distinct body regions, and these are probably the body segments that you grew up learning about. So although this grasshopper has a whole bunch of other labels on it, the only ones I care about are the head, thorax, and abdomen. So if we look at the head, if you want to characterize what's found in the head region, this is where a lot of the sensory organs are found. This is where the eyes are found. This is where uh, the bulk of the nervous tissue is found. They don't really have true brains, but they, they do have a mass of um, nerve cells in the head region. This is where they're uh, eating things as well. So you can almost think of the head like our head. Uh, it pretty much has a lot of the same functionality as it does in insects. 
Uh, the next one is the thorax. So the thorax, although it has a couple of different functions, for the most part, the thorax is where all of the appendages are attaching to. So with this grasshopper, you can see all six of its legs are attached to the thorax and its wings for the insects that are flying are also attached to the thorax. There's other stuff going on inside, but for the most part, appendage attachment is what's happening in the thorax. And then finally, uh, the bulk of at least this grasshopper is the abdomen. The abdomen is where a bulk of the organs are. So the digestive system, the respiratory system, um, the those are the big ones. Um, so the major organs and systems are found in the abdomen. Again, these are not exclusive. You might find an organism that has some limbs attached to the abdomen. You might find some organs in the thorax, but by and large, head, sensory organs, thorax, limb attachment, and then abdomen being where a bulk of the, uh, a bulk of the organs are found. Now, one thing I want to talk about in subphylum hexapoda is a, an, a topic we've already explored before, but I want to bring it up again, but in a different context. So the idea of coevolution. Now, you might be looking at this and be like, oh, yeah, coevolution between a pollinator and a, a flower, but that's not what I'm talking about while that might be happening. And um, what we actually see happening is uh, a predator-prey coevolution. And remember, coevolution was the evolution of one organism driving another organism and vice versa. With our pollinators and the flowers that they're pollinating, remember the pollinators are getting an exclusive food source, the flowers that need pollinating are getting an exclusive pollinator, so upping their reproductive success. Uh, so you see this relationship where they're driving each other's evolution. Well, this type of coevolution is a predator-prey one. So let's talk about the organisms that we uh, see in this picture. So the butterfly that we're looking at right here, this is a monarch butterfly. And monarch butterflies nearly exclusively feed on milkweeds. I actually shouldn't say that. They don't exclusively feed on milkweeds, but they exclusively lay their eggs on milkweed weed plants. Now, milkweeds are poisonous. Uh, you eat them, well, us as humans, we'd get sick, but insects that eat them um, can die from it. So it's actually a very poisonous substance. And the reason the milkweed does this, it's a type of defense. You know, your biggest predator as a plant are insects uh, that are eating your leaves. And so what the milkweed does is it produces this toxin. And this toxin is supposed to kill all the things eating its leaves. However, the milkweed caterpillar is kind of immune to this toxin. And it goes one step further. It accumulates the toxins in its own tissues. That part doesn't really matter with coevolution, but it's kind of cool. And so what happens is that the milkweeds that within the variation of that population, the milkweeds that produce more or more potent poison is going to kill more caterpillars. So you start seeing a change in the milkweed population getting more and more poisonous. Well, of these monarch caterpillars, these caterpillars, the ones that happen to have, through genetic variation, happen to have more resistance are the ones surviving. The ones with less resistance are dying. And so our monarch butterfly caterpillars are becoming more resistant. And so their higher resistance is driving the more potent poison in milkweed. The more potent poison in milkweed is driving the poison resistance in the caterpillar. And so we almost see what gets referred to as an arms race. This gets used kind of in human terms, such as during the Cold War. Well, Russia has nukes, so we have nukes. And if we have more nukes, they're making more nukes, etc. But we also see this in biology as well, where each of these organisms, the predator and the prey, are developing these adaptations to fight or evade the other. And they just keep going back and forth.
This is just one example. Um, insects and plants are great examples, but there's a lot of predator-prey relationships that you can probably come up with to explain coevolution in the context of predators and prey. All right, so this was uh, one of our subphylums. The next subphylum we'll talk about, we're not going to go too um, in depth with them, but the reason I bring them up is just because you see them, like you, you've seen these before. So subphylum myriapoda. So this kind of myria means lots, and then here's that feet again. And if you look at these organisms, the centipedes and the millipedes, they have lots of feet. But there is a difference. If you see this picture, that centipede looks very different from a millipede. And so let's talk about that difference really quick. So centipedes, first off, centi usually refers to 100. They do not have 100 legs. What they do have though is that if you look at an individual segment, so we'll look at this one. If you look at an individual segment, they only have one pair of legs. There's a leg right here and there's a leg on the other side. You could also think of this as two legs. So a pair of legs is the same thing as two legs. Don't mix those up. A pair means two. So it either has a pair of legs or you could say it has two legs per segment. These are the bad ones. These are the ones you should not play with. These are the ones that can kill you. It's not all centipedes, but a lot of centipedes uh, are venomous enough to make it hurt. Um, and some of them are so venomous that they can kill a, a human adult. Uh, so avoid them. You find them in dark caves. You should avoid dark caves anyway. Uh, so these guys, don't mess with them. Just let them do their thing. If they're in your house, just burn down your house and go move somewhere else. Uh, just don't deal with them. But on the other hand, there's also millipedes. So milli typically means a thousand. They do not have a thousand eggs, uh, sorry, a thousand legs, but they do have more legs than centipedes. So although centi and milli are not correct, it's not a hundred and a thousand legs, they are correct relative to one another. Millipedes have more legs than centipedes. And the way a millipede works is that for every one of its body segments, and this millipede has tons of body segments, I'll try to highlight one of them, each body segment has two pairs of legs. And again, if you have two pairs, this is the same thing as saying it has four legs. So these legs are a lot smaller. Um, so there's two on one side and then there's uh, two on the other side. And these guys are cute. Um, I say cute because they are. They just, you see all their legs going. Um, these guys are typically decomposers. Same with, um, same with some species of centipedes. So millipedes are what you typically find if you're flipping over rocks because they're just kind of chilling in the soil, eating dead leaves. Um, they're really good um, organisms to have in your ecosystem. Uh, so you've probably seen these a lot. You may have even seen centipedes before as well. Uh, but again, avoid centipedes. Um, they have less legs than our millipedes. Millipedes, really good ecosystem service.